I'd like to introduce our guest this morning who is um, coming to talk to us about Mission to Mars, um, Laura Parkinson Lark, um, a former Googler. Welcome back. Many of you may remember me as Laura Parkinson, um, though I am now Laura Lark. Uh, so I was actually a Googler for about five years. Um, I worked on the Muppet team and in Kornistan until I left last January to go to, to, go to Mars, um, but not really Mars, we'll get there, uh, to join High Seas Mission 5 as the mission specialist in IT and media slash outreach. Um, my crewmates had shorter titles. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about Mars. Mars is really far away. Uh, so if at their farthest, if Mars were at the back of the room, the moon is somewhere around the middle of my nostril. Um, sorry, if my face is the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Important premise. <laughs> and Mars were at the back of the room, the moon would be somewhere around the middle of my nostril, and the ISS is probably so close to my skin you couldn't fit a hair between it and me. Um, so it's much, much farther than we've sent humans before. Uh, so this carries a couple, um, a couple implications. So teams on Mars would have to be much more autonomous than teams on the ISS or even on the moon. You know, you can't have uh, teams of people sitting in mission control, watching their every move and telling them what to do. Um, they're going to be operating on their own. They're going to be much uh, less in control of mission control. Um, so it also means that if you send a team there and they don't get along or they're not effective for some reason, that's really expensive because it's so expensive to send them there in the first place. Um, so uh, NASA has identified some gaps, including uh, gaps in what we know about how to send people to Mars, including some to do with team cohesion. And to help fill these gaps, uh, NASA funds high seas. So high seas is basically a psychological study. They're looking at team cohesion and team selection for long duration space missions. Um, so to do this, they run simulated long duration Mars missions. Uh, they've got a habitat, they uh, select crews and put them in the habitat and collect a bunch of data and see what happens. So there have been five crews so far. Uh, crews two through four were, uh, they focused on crew cohesion. Um, for crews five and six, um, so I was crew five, uh, crew six goes into the HAB, I think, in February. Um, they're focusing on crew cohesion still and also crew selection. Uh, and so their goal is to figure out how to choose and support teams so that they'll be cohesive and highly performing in Mars-like conditions. Um, so when we talk about Mars-like conditions, uh, usually what people talk about is isolated, confined, and extreme. So that's the acronym you see, ICE. Uh, so the conditions at high seas are isolated and confined. They are not extreme because um, last I checked, it's not legal to put human research subjects in mortal danger. Um, but the information gained from high seas can be combined with information from the ISS or crews in the Antarctic bases um, or even uh, missions in NEMO, the underground, the underwater laboratory, um, to get a holistic picture of how to send teams to Mars. So, let's talk about the HAB. Um, so, this is a picture of the high seas habitat. Um, so, it's on Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii. As you can see, it's quite. Uh, visually and physically isolated. It's pretty far off a main road that is not traveled very much. Um, way up in the middle of these lava fields, so not a lot of green visible. Um, it's at 8,200 feet elevation, about 10 miles from the caldera of Mauna Loa. Um, did not prove to be a problem for us. Um, and it's also chosen for its geological similarity to Mars. So actually, the Johnson Space Center Mars regolith simulant, aka fake Mars dirt, is mined about 20 miles from here. Um, so uh, 
The, the HAB itself, it has about 1,200 square feet of space, 1,000 feet um, usable, and it consists of this dome here and an attached storage container. Uh, they're connected by a little tunnel sort of thing, and um, it's all our living space. We've also got our solar panels that we get our energy from, our water tanks, our, you can see our um, waste water tank slash evaporation field. Uh, so this is the setup of the HAB. Um, inside, we've got basically one big area for living, working, eating, meetings, uh, everything we need to do, exercise, uh, half a desk each, and then upstairs, we've each got a private room. Um, studies show that privacy is important psychologically. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> this is my room. So you can see about enough uh, space for a desk and a bed. Um, basically, everybody gets a wedge of the pie in the upstairs. Um, and of course, because we are on Mars, you have to suit up to leave. And I'll get to that later. Um, so the crew were the lucky ones who got to go. But there's a whole uh, system of people supporting the mission. Um, and in a way, this is part of what's being studied. Because the current, the current paradigm of mission control and a crew that is in close contact all the time and um, very much controlled by mission control isn't going to work um, when you're as far away as crews will be. So uh, we have a team of people there to assist us called Mission Support. Um, it's about 30 volunteers from around the world. They take shifts. Uh, we've got a first tier support that's there to answer questions, get us information, help us solve problems um, for 12 hours a day, and then someone on 24 hours a day in case we have a real emergency. Um, so we also have our uh, technical and engineering support. These are the people who set up the network, uh, who actually built the HAB and can help us. Um, for example, uh, at one point, our water tanks weren't leveling. And it turned out to be an undocumented one-way valve. Um, so they help us with this sort of issue. We also have a geologist on staff um, who helps us both uh, with our assigned field work as part of the simulation um, and just with questions that we have about the area around the HAB. Of course, there's um, mission management who uh, actually makes sure things run, gets us water deliveries, this sort of thing, uh, and the primary researchers. So there are many studies going on during each mission um, on us. And there's a team of researchers conducting these. Uh, and then assorted external partners, so both uh, media, like you can see here, a couple of people from the New York Times, as well as um, our project manager and local mission support person, uh, and various external researchers who some of the crew worked with. Um, and I will say, with this sort of thing, it's very important to have some local mission support, um, since practically we, we are a bunch of people living on Earth, not on Mars, and need people to do things like drive up food every so often and take away garbage uh, and be there in case one of us needs to be driven to the doctor in a non-emergency way or something. Uh, so let's see, here you can see a couple of our, uh, engineers, our engineers and the crew inside the HAB. Uh, so a major aspect of the mission and of the isolation was our communication setup. Um, so at its farthest, Mars is about 24 light minutes away. So this means real-time communication would be impossible. Uh, so to simulate this, we communicated with mission support, with our friends and family, with everybody outside the crew through email that had a delay of 20 minutes put in each way, um, and through an online tool that also uh, both introduced a delay and tracked our communications for research. Um, we also had no access to regular interactive sites that you might like to use, like Google. Um, which can make problem solving pretty difficult. So <laughs> when we needed information, um, so with the exception of a few sites like Wikipedia that we did have access to, because if you were going to Mars, you had to download and bring Wikipedia. Um, 
so with the exception of that, if we needed information, say, uh, you know, I'm running into some issue, can you search around, see if you can find someone who has the same problem, tell me what they said. I need to describe my problem to mission support in such a way that they will be able to search around on my behalf and get me information back. So this was really a, an excellent exercise in clear communication. Uh, and it definitely went both ways. So we had to be clear with mission support. They also needed to be clear with us. Uh, so I remember once early in the mission, um, we were quite water constrained. The company that had delivered water to the previous crew had on short notice announced that they weren't willing to drive up the road to the HAB anymore. And so we had about, uh, our tanks were about half full, and we had no water delivery scheduled or way to get water. Uh, so we were conserving pretty heavily. We were down to about two gallons per person per day and had been there for maybe a week. It was starting to get smelly. And we get an email from mission support saying, the water truck is coming. And I have never seen this crew work together so well or so quickly. Everybody sprang into action and got their showers in, got laundry going, drained the water from the tanks so that we could water the plants. Uh, and in about a half an hour, we drained um, a, nearly all of our remaining usable water from the tanks. Uh, so 40 minutes later, you know, 20 minutes here, 20 minutes back, we get a second email that says the water trucks are coming to see if they can get up the road. <laughs> it was really, it was an emotional roller coaster that day. <laughs> um, so fortunately for us, they were able to get up the road. They weren't there to deliver that day, but they came a few days later. We had an emergency tank that, lucky for us, was cleaned for the first time just before our mission started. Um, so we were able to uh, transfer some water and you know, not run dry. Um, but it illustrates the importance of clear communication in both ways when your only method is email. Um, so uh, we. Uh, the communication delay also meant that, uh, to a large degree, our social support had to come from inside the HAP. So we were allowed as much communication as we wanted with family and friends, um, encouraged to email with them or uh, transfer video files even, um, though I think people didn't end up taking much advantage of that because there's really not a lot of audio privacy in the HAP. So even something as simple as like, hi, I had a fine day, how are you? It feels really awkward when all of your crew is sitting there and can hear you. Um, but it, So it means that the crew really becomes each other's family, friends, colleagues. It is a self-contained social network, and all of your support tends to come from that, which makes maintaining relationships with each other really, really important. Um, so. Uh, as I tell you about the mission, I'm also going to tell you a few conclusions that I drew that I think may be relevant to life here at Google, and this brings me to the first one. Um, so uh, what I, one thing that I found underlaid a lot of our success, um, both as a team in s maintaining our relationships as a group and individually with each other, and in our successes at our assigned tasks, our geological field work, or getting data for the researchers, um, was our mutual commitment to doing so. So early in the mission, we sat down as a crew, and we wrote a mission statement for ourselves. Um, so of course, there are things that we were supposed to do because it was our job, but we decided to decide for ourselves as well what was important to us. And we decided that as a crew, we were committed to being a cohesive team, high quality outreach, and getting good data for the researchers, um, so high quality data. And this provided a very important foundation for the rest of the mission. It meant that if, you know, if I'm having an issue with somebody, I need to take them aside, um, whether it's just that we need to talk and resolve miscommunication, or I need them to change their behavior in some way, I know that they're going to be right there with me, solving the problem with me, working with me. Um, because we already committed to each other to do so uh, in a really wholehearted, genuine way. Um, so, uh, and 
I, so I encourage teams that need to accomplish something like, I mean, not exactly like this, but need to accomplish something serious together, like probably all of you, uh, to come up with principles that you can all be really genuinely committed to together. Um, and I don't mean goals like OKRs, you know, what are we getting done in the next month or something, but uh, core values like being a cohesive team. Okay, back to the, back to the fun stuff. So I'll tell you a little bit about Have Life now. Um, so as you would need on Mars, all of our food had to be shelf stable for three years and somewhat realistic. Uh, so that meant mostly freeze dried food. Uh, cans would be too heavy, it'd be too expensive to send, they're unrealistic. So um, lots of bags and cans of odd looking stuff like this. I think we have here uh, milk, freeze dried salmon, chicken cubes, beef crumbles, soup, and mozzarella. Um, <laughs> so I, surprisingly, it was actually not too hard to make delicious food out of this. Uh, they smell really weird, but when rehydrated are delicious. <laughs> um, so I think one of the Hab favorites was deep dish pizza, for example. It turns out it's pretty easy to make a decent tomato sauce. You throw in the powdered tomato, the dried onions, and just keep doing that and some spices until you sop up the water. Um, the cheese, it, if, you, if you bake it after rehydrating, it sort of loses its crunchy inner, inner core and um, gets a lot more palatable. <laughs> So the, the exception to this is food that we grow. Uh, so we had a few systems for doing so in the HAB, actually mostly not by the window, um, both, both because that's ineffective and unrealistic. Uh, we had a couple of hydroponic systems. A crewmate of mine used to work on Veggie, which is the system they use on the ISS for growing vegetables. Um, so he got them to send us a prototype and he was working with that. Uh, as well as its earthbound, outreach-focused counterpart, Growing Beyond Earth. So we had uh, those in the hab and got quite a bit of produce from them, as well as just some grow lights in the back that we could grow stuff with. So we had not a lot, but um, enough for a bite every so often of various greens and peas, beans, even a few tomatoes um, that were a, an occasional treat. I remember once, um, Earl, my crewmate who works on veggie, and I were, uh, we'd harvested about a month's worth of, uh, of leafy stuff, and we were making a salad. And Jay smelled it from his room. So upstairs, door closed, he comes out, are you cutting lettuce? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it really was a treat. But uh, yeah. So um, we did not bring all of our food with us to begin with. Um, we had, we, probably could have lived off of what was in the hab to begin with. Uh, but we got three or four um, what we call resupplies throughout the mission, AKA hab Christmas. Um, so you can see here a pretty typical resupply. Uh, we've got tomato flakes, beef crumbles, I think some strawberries, and in the back, the all important toilet paper. Um, so at every resupply, uh, so for the resupplies, we'd submit our requests for what we wanted a month, about maybe two months in advance, and then the resupply would be for two, three months. So we were planning many months ahead, uh, but did get to have some input as far as our taste in food. Um, if you were actually going to Mars, the crew would probably know each other for years ahead of time and would be able to help plan the food that gets sent. Um, but it turned out that for each resupply, there tended to be something that we didn't, didn't budget per perfectly. Um, one resupply, it was paper towels that we were really looking forward to. Another, I think it was onions. And once, uh, it was bananas. So two crewmates of mine were really looking forward to the freeze-dried bananas. We'd been out for a month or something. Um, and they loved the freeze-dried bananas. So. Uh, the, my crewmate and I, who were out picking up the resupply that day, you know, we get to where it is, um, and there's a big box, and it says bananas, and so it's 20 pounds of freeze-dried bananas. Which, for reference, the box is maybe this big. Like I could fit in that box. It's a lot of bananas. <laughs> so we tell them over the radio, we got bananas, uh, and as we're bringing them back up, um, 
it was it was dark at the time, and I see we have this LED strip in the hab, and they turned it on to be a rainbow strobe light, and the hab was pumping out Gwen Stefani, B A N A N A. <laughs> there was a lot of excitement in the hab that day. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, another way in which the mission was somewhat realistic uh, was in our limited resources. Um, so these are our solar panels. With very little exception, all of our energy came from these. So cloudy days, we'd need to conserve. Sunny days, less so. Um, if, we did, if we had multiple cloudy days in a row, we had a backup gener generator we could run, um, keep critical hub systems up and running. Uh, and if for some reason we weren't able to go out, for example, we had um, some pretty heavy sustained winds at one point, we had hydrogen fuel cells that would kick in as a backup. Um, so we weren't actually in, we had uh, lots of redundancy and weren't in danger of uh, our systems going down or anything. Um, but mainly our power was from solar, uh, which ended up being less constraining than the water. Um, so, uh, since high seas is a psychological study, they are simulating things um, well enough to be relevant psychologically. So, for example, our water was limited, but we weren't exer exercising recyclers. It came from tanks. Um, so, uh, it was sort of up to us to limit our use. Um, I think possibly, again, for legal reasons, they're not allowed to tell us not to use water. Um, but uh, so we ended up using about five to six gallons per person per day. For reference, this is about 5% of what the average American uses. Uh, so we did this with a, a few methods, including um, you know bucket bathing rather than showering. So we were allowed eight minutes of shower per week. Um, but often chose to use that in a couple bunches with um, a little bit of bathing between. Um, <clears throat> this is, you can see here, our dishes set up. So we've got our grime bucket, our soap bucket, our rinse bucket uh, that we can, that allows us to do a whole dinner's worth of dishes with only a couple extra gallons because we can sort of move everything left as we go and reuse the water as it gets dirtier. Um, so it was up to us to come up with this sort of system to conserve. Uh, and one important way or thing that we had that allowed us to do so was that we had composting toilets. Um, so we had a couple of these in the hab. It was up to us to keep them happy, which was important to both their and our quality of life. Um, so we turned them a couple times a week, put in microbes, and then uh, emptied them once a week, uh, one of the more glamorous aspects of living on Mars. Uh, it was actually a somewhat coveted chore, because uh, although it's not super pleasant, it, it can sort of end up being a bonding experience. You know, you either end up with someone who's really OK with it, and then that's kind of fun, or who's <laughs> entertained by not being OK with it. And then that's just fun for both of you, <laughs> for one of you. <laughs> um, so uh, it was a somewhat coveted chore because it took less time than the other chores um, and was ended up being kind of fun, at least for me, because I didn't really mind it. Um, so uh, in addition to uh, the resource con conservation and the shelf-stable food, uh, we had to exercise quite a bit. So this was both for our own health, because we're in this very small space for a long time. We need to um, keep our hearts healthy and such. Uh, but also because on Mars, you would have to exercise quite a bit, we think, uh, to maintain your bone density and muscle mass, um, and also your health, since you would be in a confined space. So we had about an hour and a half allocated each day to exercise. Um, I think on the ISS, it's even more. It might be two or three hours per day. Uh, but so this simulated the time drain and the energy drain of having to exercise that much. Um, so lastly, uh, both for our own um, psychological well-being and uh, health as a group community, we had quite a lot of fun together. Uh, so we'd watch movies, play games. Um, have special dinners. We had a couple of hibachi nights where two crew members would get out the griddle and 
um, marinate some of the beef cubes and then chop it all up on the griddle and throw things at each other. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of our open mic nights. So we had a couple of these. Uh, we would sort of rearrange the hab and turn it into a coffee shop, take out some of the tables that we used for some of the research tasks, and uh, perform things for each other. Uh, so it was, uh, it was really up to us to make the hab a lively social environment. And that was one of the parts I enjoyed most about it. Yes, yes they are. We made some donuts. Um, we had flour and yeast, which you could argue is more like two years shelf stable, um, but would probably be good enough, uh, especially if you kept it in the right conditions. Um, I also had a sourdough starter for, uh, for most of the mission, and then it got too cold for it. Um, and also, I stopped feeding it, and one of these things probably killed it. <laughs> Uh, so I get asked a lot, what do we do all day? Uh, so we're cooped up in this dome, we're pretending to be on Mars, what's our actual job? So first and foremost, we are lab rats. We are the subjects of the primary research. Um, so as part of this, we give spit and hair samples. These will be measured after the mission um, for stress hormones to study both how this varies monthly throughout the mission and how it varies throughout the day. So um, on certain days, we'll give several spit samples throughout the day, and those will be give you the daily rhythm. And then every month, we um, shave a little bit of our head. So I have a bald spot for science now. Um, we also wear sociometric badges. So these measure our proximity to each other, uh, only four hours a day, not all the time. Um, so these measure our proximity to each other and the volumes of our voices and are also connected to, uh, to heart rate monitors. So we hear that from this, they can tell whether we're having an argument um, or whether we're avoiding each other, though I think they may be more accurately detecting whether we are playing video games. <laughs> uh, so we also wear 24-7 uh, act watches, which, are, which have accelerometers and light sensors as part of a sleep study. Um, so in addition to the actual uh, physical metrics, we do quite a few team activities. Um, so here's one, for example. Uh, there are sometimes games or things that we need to do to calibrate the equipment. Um, and through these and through surveys associated with them, the researchers are measuring our communication with each other, our interactions with each other, how well we're cooperating, uh, this sort of thing. Um, I also get asked if we recorded, and we were, we were asked to record some portions of our life. So for example, all of our meetings were recorded, and they'll be analyzed for you know, who's speaking up, who's being heard, um, how are we interacting. Uh, and also, all of our uh, EVA data is both audio and video recorded. And then we bundle that up and send it to the researchers. Um, and lastly, they get a lot of information through surveys. So we did a lot of surveys, more than 1,000 each. First thing when we wake up, the last thing before we go to bed, we fill out surveys. These are everything from uh, self-perceived stress to uh, s surveys asking about how we're doing, uh, treating us as a family, to uh, describe what happened this week, what was most difficult in these different ways. Um, so that's where a lot of the data for the study is coming from. So we also had quite a bit of time allocated for personal projects. Uh, so mine, I brought a drone and uh, basically focused on what it could be used for. So uh, I used it to build models of relevant parts of the area around the HAB, um, used it for scouting, both to try and find things and uh, to look at an area without having to go there first. Um, this is a uh, model that I built with it. Um, and turns out you can do all sorts of things. Once you've got an elevation model, you can compute elevation profiles from that, slopes, changes in elevation, volumes, um, all kinds of useful stuff. Other people on the crew were working, like I said, on veggie. Uh, one person was working on manufacturing um, molecules in a constrained lab like you ha might have on Mars. 
um, useful for things like medicine, since uh, one problem uh, about or one challenge for long duration space flight is that a lot of medicine has a shelf life of less than you'd probably be out there. Uh, so being able to manufacture this sort of stuff in situ is pretty important. Um, others were looking at uh, optimizing our resource usage in the HAB, sampling lava tubes for what might be growing there, um, 3D printing, a bunch of stuff. Um, and lastly, we spent quite a bit of time on EVA. Uh, so EVA stands for extravehicular activity. This is when we suit up and go outside the HAB. Um, but it's not that simple. So if we want to go outside the HAB, uh, the day before, we have a meeting. We plan what we're going to do. Um, we practice it if necessary. We write up a request, and we send it to mission support. If they approve it, then the next day, about a half an hour before we're scheduled to go out, we you know, gather our personal equipment, batteries, water, whatever we need, uh, suit up, get ready. And we still can't go outside. Um, because if you were actually on Mars, the outside pressure and the inside pressure are very different. And the outside pressure is not so suitable for humans. And the pe if you just opened the door, the people inside would probably not thank you. Um, so we simulate de decompression by uh, sealing off a part of the hab and waiting for a little while. Uh, so once we decompress, we, um, well, I mean, for a defined little while. Uh, so once we decompress, we can go outside. Uh, we follow the route that we planned ahead of time. Um, we are constrained by the time that we requested. Uh, we come back in. Uh, we recompress. And we're still not done, because we need to uh, debrief with each other. We need to process a lot of the data from the EVA, write summaries, send them to mission support. Um, so going outside, although it's quite autonomous in the actual execution of it is still um, highly controlled, as it probably would be if you were on Mars, given that going outside is one of the more dangerous things you would have to do. Uh, and throughout the whole thing, we stay in contact with each other via radio and are required at all times to be in contact with the person inside the HAB, who's called HABCOM, or IV for intravehicular. Uh, so. This brings me to the second thing I'd like to talk to you about, uh, which is this process. Uh, so we found we had a, a great number of successful EVAs and a great number of unsuccessful EVAs, and found that the successful ones were usually due to good uh, execution of this process. And when we had an unsuccessful one, it was usually because we'd failed somewhere in here. So I think usually when people think, you know, I have something critical I need to do. I'll plan it, and then I'll do it. Um, but there's more to it than that. So for example, once we were, we were trying to measure uh, cross sections of a lava tube, we were trying to validate a digital method that, we'd, um, that we wanted to use for future tasks. And so we were choosing cross sections to measure. And that turned out to be really contentious when we were out in the field. Um, one person would say, this is the cross-section we need. Another would say, it's too close to the opening. There's too much ambient light here. And there's really, it's not the place to have a discussion like this. You need to have had that kind of discussion before you go out. And when you go out, it's just time for execution. Um, and we figured out when we got back in, it was because the different people out had different ideas of what problem we were trying to solve with the data that we were collecting. So we hadn't done a good enough job of defining the problem that we had. Um, another time, we were, uh, we were planning an emergency route in case we needed to do a simulated evacuation to a lava tube. So if you were on Mars, occasionally there are periods of higher radiation. Um, you know, the sun releases a bunch of particles. And here, we're protected by our magnetosphere. But on Mars, you'd need to shield yourself somehow. And one suggestion is that people might hunker down in a lava tube until it passes. Uh, so we were planning an evacuation route to a lava tube nearby. Um, and uh, because we knew that this sort of thing might come day or night, we needed to mark it out in a way that would be easy to follow at night as well. So we actually we went out ahead of time. Um, requested a night EVA and tested 
the different kinds of markers we had. And it turns out that what we thought would work well, we had these super shiny pieces of tape. Um, was impossible to see unless you had it at just the right angle uh, because it would reflect your flashlight off somewhere that wasn't your eyes. Um, but we had these little orange flags that turned out to be super fluorescent. And those worked really well. So we ended up finding this out and marking the path with them. Um, we did a simulate, or we requested to practice at night to make sure that it worked, um, which was one of the odder experiences because it was one of the times when we were all outside together. So usually two out, two in for safety. Um, but we had gotten permission to practice this evacuation. And so all six of us were out with our supplies at night. And I was imagining what someone would think if they found us, six people in a line in hazmat suits walking across the lava in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd be concerned. Um, yes. So I think this, this process applies to uh, any, any group that needs to do something critical, something that needs to go right the first time. So we did EVAs for a variety of reasons. Um, a lot of it was purely operational, take down the trash, take down the poop. This is the, um, the pile that we had near the end of the mission. I think the last pickup was around three months ago. Um, so this is the sort of stuff you don't want hanging around in the hab. Um, we go down to pick up resupplies, uh, sometimes check on our water tanks, see how the levels are doing, uh, run the generator if we need to, which we did a couple times. Um, we were also assigned quite a bit of geological field work. This is actually the main reason that we go outside, is to collect data of various sorts uh, on the area around the HAB. Um, so some of it was straight up measurements. Um, because the geological field work is part of the study, a lot of it is focused on our teamwork while we do it. The tasks are actually are part of the control between missions. So. Uh, each mission gets the same ones, which is why I won't tell you a ton about them. Um, but uh, so, like I was saying, a lot of it turned out to be straight up physical measurements of things around the HAB. Um, some of it was uh, mapping the geological units. So, you know, go see where flows intersect and try and figure out, uh, you know, what came first, how old is this. Some of it was pretty qualitative. Um, so, look at things like this that uh, are these really weird formations. You know, there's this thing on the top of the hill, and last I checked, lava flowed like a liquid and obeyed the laws of gravity. So how did these weird lumps that are you know, about this big come to be? So go look at them and try and deduce what, how they formed, what happened here. Um, and some of it was. Uh, more focused on the inside, take samples, come in. This is a picture of an olivine crystal in a chunk of a pahoehoe flow near the hab. Um, we were also working with a team out of NASA Goddard. So this is this instrument is a called a mini LHR, miniature laser heterodyne radiometer or something. Um, it measures trace gases in the column of air between it and the sun. So they're looking at CO2 and methane in the atmosphere. Uh, so this had two purposes. They were actually using the data from this. Um, and it was also a study of how we would communicate with the researchers behind it to collect the data, to fix it when things went wrong. It did at one point get out of alignment, and we were figuring out how to level it and what might be wrong with it. Um, we got to do quite a few emergency drills. Um, which tended to be a lot of fun. And we also got uh, quite a bit of freedom to, um, to go on exploratory EVAs. So go out and check out lava tubes or skylights or uh, just go see things that looked like they might be interesting on Google Earth or uh, that we'd seen in a drone flight. And this brings me to the third thing I'd like to talk to you about. Um, so this is us in a lava tube. That was one of my favorite parts. Um, so over and over, we found that work that we did for one reason, whether it was for fun, just because we thought it might be interesting, we wanted to go there, um, or maybe we were out with the drone filming just to, just to film. 
uh, we'd, found, we'd find that this work would be useful in unexpected other ways. So maybe we'd happened to get footage of an area that we needed to go for mission-related purposes later. And now we can actually make a plan with some knowledge of what it looks like there um, instead of with whatever we can glean from Google Earth, which is not much. Um, or you know, maybe we've actually been there before. It's a lava tube that we've already explored. So for example, once we mapped a lava tube system just for fun to try mapping, uh, but ended up uh, knowing the right amount about it to use it for an emergency drill later. Um, so to some extent, I'm preaching to the choir here, Google with its 20% time. Um, but we, I encourage all of you to continue what exploratory work you do, um, because in my experience, it is very, it is valuable in unexpected ways. Um, and in my opinion, that applies to space flight as a whole as well. Um, there have been many, many unexpected benefits to life on Earth from the space programs so far. For example, I think there was a, a fuel valve in the shuttle, maybe you've heard of this, that turned out to be just perfect for um, the time between when you need a heart and when you get a heart for little kids. Like they hadn't figured out how to make reliable little valves like that until they did it for the shuttle and now they can use them for hearts. Um, anyway. So I, I can't tell you too much about the actual geology tasks, but I can tell you some about the various challenges of being on EVA. Um, so this is me trying to, I think trying to fit in that hole, um, which is a bit difficult in these suits because they're quite bulky, um, as suits would be. Um, we also had some, some visibility issues. So this was one of the ways in which having the mini LHR there, which was attempted to, they, they attempted to build it for our situation, um, but we turned out to have a lot of challenges with it. I think this person is trying to see the screen. Um, and this person is trying to see an illuminated dot that is sort of right at the base of the barrel there. Um, again, an, an exercise in communication. We. Uh, this may be relevant to you as well, but we found videos to be a much easier way of uh, sending scientific information than written descriptions. So here we were told that it is aligned if you see an illuminated dot. And so we thought there must be an LED. We can kind of squint and see through the visor this thing that looks like it might be an LED. So I think this person is trying to see if the LED is on. Turns out the illuminated dot is created uh, by a shadow. So <laughs> at the end of the barrel, there's this little hole. And if it's perfectly aligned with the sun, then the sun will cast this little spot right on what is a sensor, not an LED. And so when we were looking for the illuminated dot, we were actually just making it go away by shading the whole thing with our enormous heads. <laughs> um, you can see the visibility here. I can, I can see so well that I can't tell my thumb is in the picture. Um, and so some of these are relevant to our suits and some of them are relevant to actual suits. One of, uh, one of those things is actual suits will have to be pretty durable. Um, this is my suit in the last week or so of the mission when we were patching them up. Uh, so you can see it gets pretty beat up. Um, and Earth lava, while sharp, is still not as sharp as Mars lava. Um, weathering is easier here. Um, so in case any of you ever build a spacesuit, make it really tough. Um, lastly, uh, <laughs> EVA has happened in a hazardous environment. Not, I'm just kidding. That's not about a hazardous environment, although that is my crewmate at the bottom of a pit. Um, so one consideration for setups on EVA is the communication system. Uh, so because it's important to have communication at all times between, basically between Earth and Mars, even though it's delayed, uh, you will need some way to explore all of the varieties of terrain on Mars, especially lava tubes, because those are one of the most interesting places on Mars as a potential um, habitable, habitable area. 
Um, so at the moment, I'm relaying to Habcom what my crewmate in the pit says to me, and he's relaying for the team down the tube. Uh, yes. So communication, something to be solved. So uh, the mission ended on September 17th. We were in there for 242 days total. Um, six people went in, the same six people went out, so that's a success in my book. Uh, and we built a team from this group of strangers. And I'm happy to take questions. And please use the microphones. Thanks for sharing. Um, so you mentioned that part of mission five was about team selection mm -hmm. also. Can you tell us a little about the selection process? Sure. Um, so what I can tell you what I experienced from the selection process. Um, so the, uh, the first step that actually involved my interaction was a whole bunch of psychological surveys. So things like, Everything from what time of day you like to be awake to how you cope with stress. Um, just a whole bunch of different screens. Uh, the second part was an asynchronous interview. So it was a system where it asks you questions. You have something like a minute to think and three minutes to record. Um, and that was the process. There were six people. Can you go down into how those six people operate? Do they operate a single crew of six, or they get broken down into like twos and threes? And mm -hmm. uh, was there any hierarchy, like a sort of like team lead that drives everybody along? Mm -hmm. Something else. Yeah. Um, so I'll answer your last question first. We had a commander. That was the extent of our hierarchy. So commander, everyone else. Um, the uh, for the most part, we found that sort of formal authority not to be necessary. We did most stuff by consensus. Um, the exception was EVA, where we found a formal chain of command to be really important for getting things done effectively and efficiently. Um, so for the most part, we operated as, in work, for the most part, we operated as a team of six. Sometimes there would be certain people who were more interested in different things and would tend to work on them more. Um, but we saw it as our group responsibility to complete them one way or the other, whether that was a couple people are interested and volunteer or we all pitch in. Um, socially, I think people tended to break up a bit more. Um, so we, we did spend a lot of time as a group. We also spent a lot of time in twos and threes. Thanks for sharing. Um, can you talk about the psychological results? You said that that was what they were studying of you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess they probably haven't, maybe they haven't released the, the results publicly, but at least like qualitative, qual qualitatively from your perspective, like how people changed over the time that you were there? Um, the, the short, sad answer is no. Um, both because the research is still ongoing since the next mission is part of it, um, and because as a participant, I'm not privy to the researchers' conclusions yet. Um, they'll publish in probably a couple of years once the next mission is done. Um, I know that personally, I, I think I became a more independent person as a result of the mission. Um, I definitely improved my interpersonal skills. Um, but I, I can't say anything about broader conclusions. Hi. Thank you for sharing. It's been really interesting hearing about your experiences. Um, I'm curious to know what's next for you now that you've come back. What's, what are you up to? What's your next step? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> Do you have any specific interests? Or are you exploring a wide variety of different um, um, I, I definitely would like to con continue contributing to space exploration in one form or another, um, whether that's through work, study, volunteering. I have a 
question about your drone project. So was that useful because it was higher resolution than like satellite images or because terrain was like shifting on Mars? Because what? A terrain would potentially be like changing on Mars. Um, so for us, we found it useful exactly as you say, because it's much higher resolution. Um, and also because it's targeted. So um, I, I can't say we were successful, but at one point we tried to search for a lost water bottle, for example. It had fallen down someone's pant leg, and they, <laughs> um, we, we didn't recover it. We did find a, a bush that was surprisingly similar in color. <laughs> Yeah, but mainly because we could we could go get images of what we wanted, and they were they were much higher resolution than satellite imagery, imagery, and interestingly, often easier to spot things on than when we went in person. Uh, so, for example, there was there was one feature where um, it had a, uh, a a shape that was not really noticeable on the ground because it's sort of in the, the subtleties of how the rocks fall, but it's really easy to spot from an aerial image. So yeah, it filled the gap between ground and satellite. What surprised you most about your time in, in that? Um, that's a good question. I, I have no idea about most, but one thing that surprised me was how accustomed I got to the communications delay. Um, so I, I was expecting it to be weird to come out in a lot of ways, and it ended up feeling pretty normal, uh, except for instant communication. So we're so used to, you know, you send an email, the person doesn't even get it for 20 minutes. Um, and so I'd send emails and get a response back in two minutes, and it felt creepy. <laughs> Uh, like in the I didn't know you were looking kind of way. Um, yeah, so that surprised me. Uh, how did this experience affect your relationships with friends and family uh, back on Earth, so to speak, both during and after this experience? That's a good question. Um, so I think the, the mission was particularly tough for me in that regard. Um, because I got married about four months before the mission. <laughs> um, so I guess it, in a way I'm, I'm still discovering the ways in which relationships have changed, but it was, it was definitely a challenge for me and my husband to figure out how to, how to be supportive of each other when being an immediate emotional support or person to vent to isn't really an option. Um, and figuring out ways to stay connected. So for example, we'd, we had a few movie date nights. So we'd set a time to start a movie and then send a bunch of email back and forth during. So it's still delayed. But if you send enough of it, it sort of feels like you're chatting. <laughs> Hi, thank you for sharing. Um, what kind of personal effects were you allowed to bring? And kind of on the same note, uh, what did you miss most when you got there? And now that you're back, what do you miss most about being there? OK. Um, so we were allowed to bring two suitcases of anything except food, um, though I smuggled in some astronaut ice cream. Um, so I brought a, a suitcase of clothes, mostly warm clothes, a half a suitcase of craft supplies, and a violin. Um, different people made different choices. I think what I missed the most, besides obviously people while I was there, was probably fruit. Um, and I, I would definitely say I miss my crew most now that I'm back. Um, but again, people is kind of a cop out. So I guess I'd say I miss the, uh, we had a really, a really nicely scheduled life. So it was, pretty consistent. It was, um, we had a tool that we used to communicate what we were doing uh, that meant that every minute of the day was, we knew what we were supposed to be doing, um, including pre-sleep, post-sleep, lunch. Like it, it was all scheduled in there. Um, so I think having that, that tool and that structure to my day.
Thank you very much, Laura. This was a fantastic talk. Um, sure. That's uh, it for questions, but um, I assume you're going to hang around for a little bit if yeah, people want to talk to you offline. And we encourage you to stay for the uh, APE team coming up next to talk about your machine learning resource here in New York.